Please welcome back Amy Tobin and Mark Siegel. So I just wanted to underscore, I didn't want to give the punchline away, but if you were to see this film again, you would see that what the issue is, is that Edie is pregnant. It's 1965. It's not easy to get, find a doctor to give you an abortion. She's already in her life had at least one abortion. And so there is this running subtext, which has to do with Edie getting fat in the future and uh, um, uh this kind of constant needling that she knows at some point he's going to say it. And he must have been in collusion with the people behind the camera because he says it on the last possible moment as the film runs out. And you can actually hear the camera noise toward the end. The camera's running really erratically, and you've had these things that are kind of light-struck moments where uh, um, there's something really wrong with that camera. And um, they must have signaled him and said, you know, this is your last shot, get it in now. Which suggests that there is this conspiracy going on around her, that they are aware of how she is going to be treated and what they have to torture her with. And she she isn't quite clued in on this. She hasn't gotten the whole script. So that's all I wanted to say, but I didn't want to give it away at the beginning. It, it, the ends of Warhol films typically have this um, this kind of, they leave one wanting. And and I think that there there are in a number of the films uh, from what I've heard, there there was communication about the fact that the role is coming to an end. And so in this, it does seem strange that, that he then throws out abortion. Well, now I forgot the rest. Abortion, pregnancy. But, pregnancy abortion. Right. So, it, so it's as if he, these are themes that he wanted to discuss. He, mm. he, he seems, it seemed to me that in the second reel, there's this one moment where the camera gets turned off. And turn back on. Um, you, you mentioned it at dinner, a, a moment actually quite telling because it's the moment when, when they're talking about um, voyeurism and about Chuck being a voyeur. And then when they, the camera gets turned off and turned back on and then they reposition and we see Edie and um, Gino um, uh, facing uh, the camera. And it seemed to me at that point that the, the, um, the kind of nastiness, if you will, of, of Chuck's comments that he seemed much, his tone of voice changed his, his aggressiveness toward her, her, um, frustration with him, that, that something either happened when the camera was turned off or that, that, that somehow the speed of, of aggressive provocation seemed to take over. I mean seems to know that he has very little time left, that it's, it's been stretched out and he has very, you know, to get in the lethal punch. But, I mean, there's no way we can know this. I suspect that Edie actually asked to stop at that point where the camera's turned off because she thinks her makeup is running because that's mm. the first thing he says. And she's there trying to, you know, fix her face. Mm -hmm. And it's when the issue of wireism gets first brought up that she suddenly must think, I don't look so good. And um, that's when the camera gets turned off. Mm. And um, she, and then she's rearranging her face when it's turned on. But the composition has changed. Mm -hmm. and, and Gino has come around and... Yeah, and so when you you in in the introductory statements you referred to it as a narrative film, yeah. you said it's improvised, it's a narrative film. Um, now that we've seen it, it seems that you're you're saying it's it's. Or what is the narrative? How would you tell well, us now? I think, what is the... I think that Chuck is totally in control of the narrative, um, and it is very simply that Edie has been set up. She's been set up to think that she's going to have this pleasant evening with Gino, who, in this print, which is much lighter than prints I've seen, he's really a charmer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen many prints where he's almost in total darkness, mm -hmm. and you really can't hear him. This is a very, very good print of this film. Um, 
And she thinks, you know, that she knows that she's not going to fuck on camera. I mean, she absolutely knows that. But she thinks she'll have a good time, you know, flirting and whatever. And Chuck has a different agenda, and he's in charge of the narrative. And he is going to get under her skin, and finally he's going to spill the beans. I mean, he's going to make public this secret that she's, you know, had for a little bit of time that she's pregnant. And that's that's simply the narrative. But that is quite a lot of narrative for a world film. <laughs> Could, um, since you, I'll just maybe ask one more question and then um, I'd love to open it up for comments of any sort, questions from all of you. But um, you mentioned the light, the lighting, that this print seemed lighter. I mean, maybe it was sitting here in the front row, but it's, but I do recall this with other experiences seeing the film that, um, that it's blinding, that Edie's, the whiteness of her body reflects the light so strongly, the whiteness of the sheets, that it's very, she, she's, she has presence, as you describe so well, but, but you can't look at her. She's the, the, the sun that you cannot look directly in the eye. I, I felt that we're, I constantly had to look away, but I didn't want to, but only because it was painful to see this blinding whiteness. Um, and, and, I, so I'm just interested if you have some thoughts about the lighting in this film, how it works, or about the the issue of lighting in these films. Yeah. Um, Evie has, you know, incredible skin. She has white skin, very white skin. She is the white woman. I mean, she is, the in this film, the consummate white goddess. And she, um, and her skin reflects light. Uh, but, you know, you can adjust contrast ratio in printing. And I have seen prints where uh, the contrast ratio is just too strong and you lose all detail. Mm -hmm. You lose all detail of her face. But you also, the whiter the whites get, the blacker the blacks get. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just think this this is a very good print and that these values were in the film as it was shot. It's a question of printing it right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. We can maybe come back to some of these um, questions of the aesthetic of, of the film as well. But maybe for people who have just seen this for the first time, perhaps it's difficult to immediately move to the level of the aesthetic because of one trying to grasp um, the the narrative, if you will. But are there are there any questions or comments? Und wir können auch Fragen auf Deutsch um, entgegennehmen und schnell übersetzen, wenn ja. es sowas auch gibt. Geben Sie mir kurz ein Zeichen und ich komme im Mikrofon zu Ihnen. Und das schreckt immer so ab, dass jetzt keine Frage mehr kommt. <lacht> ja, hier ist eine Frage. Start a question. I couldn't, uh, um, I, all the time I was thinking of um, uh, Godard, of the movie uh, Abu Zufle. It's very much the main theme. It's like 40 minutes sitting in a bed, playing along, and finally coming to something under the blankets. And also the abortion theme is in the movie. So I wonder whether this is like... I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that... Certainly someone like Chuck was really aware of the Godard films, and there's no mistaking that Edie adopted that T-shirt. Most of the pictures you see of Edie, she's wearing the T-shirt that, uh, the not T-shirt, the Venetian sailor's shirt that Jean Seberg work, wears in Breathless, and then she cuts her hair like Jean Seberg in Breathless. Yeah, absolutely. And Amy, you said that that this framing is is unmistakably Andy Warhol's framing, but that you don't believe that he was there for the film. Or, or can no, you just talk about that no, just a little what bit? What I said was, I can't believe that he didn't frame it because the framing is so good, mm -hmm. and it has the whole issue of diagonals and the question of what is going to be the focal point of the image. The focal point of the image is not her face; it's her crotch. Um, and, um, and that is so smart mm -hmm. and the whole, uh, setup just seemed to me to be much too smart for 
Bud worked Shafter, who was a decent technician, but he certainly didn't decide where to put that camera and where to put the frame lines. I mean, so who indeed did? I don't think that Chuck was thinking visually that way. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he was a great talent, and we don't know that. Uh, but so I just suspected that Andy came by, looked through the lens, adjusted the frame, because it is very much his kind of frame with those diagonals and with the height of the camera. So it, it isn't above and it isn't below, really, but it looks like it's below. Um, I, I just thought he probably came and then he had better things to do and he went his way and let them play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually watching it was thinking of the life of Juanita Castro, um, which and knowing that Chuck Wine um, took on a lot of Ronald Tavell's strategies um, in these films. Ronald Tavell, as Amy explained, um, you know, wrote these screenplays for the first Warhol sound films. And in a number of them, he is the off screen voice trying to provoke a reaction from someone on screen, a face on screen. And then in the life of Juanita Castro, he's on screen and the camera was set um, kind of at a diagonal to the action, which was Warhol's decision, not Tavell's. And so these films were, I don't know exactly when, but I think they were made just about the same very, time. And, very close. And I wondered if it's another example of, of um, Warhol's decision that the action will play out, oh, I mean, like a police interrogation. Um, on over here, and the camera will be here. Yeah, no, I think I think mm -hmm. those films are comparable. In you know, if you're going to diagram what's going on, mm -hmm. you would end up with pretty much the same diagram mm -hmm. in terms of sight lines and yeah. Are there other comments, questions, Regina, Pranga? I'll try. Um, um, I think it's it's not a na narrative film, isn't it? Because uh, it, uh, we, 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 we are watching a tableau, a picture, like a painting. I had the impression uh, that uh, it's not only uh, this quotation of Godard, but a quotation referring to Impressionism or Post-Impressionism. Uh, you can think of uh, um, Cézanne, L'après-midi à Naples, it's a, um, a, par a, parody, a parody on uh, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, these things. And I think this play with light and shadow is like uh, distancing the viewer. You told us about this method of distancing uh, the, the viewer. And this seems for me his method here to, to give us a theatrical stage like like a, a firm stable stage like a theatrical representation and also a, a, f a firm stable a, a fixed picture it's it's a framed a framed picture and so he he can um, deconstruct a classical cinema space in this way i i, I see this this uh, this crossing this interference between the picture and this um, action axis this axis of the action is different so he he he, he it's difficult he, he avoids he, he, he does not give the reverse shot and that's the point for me so so it's it's no narrative it would be a narrative if he if he would give after the uh, if, if he would give after the, sh the cut a reverse shot so, so there's no no um, off-screen space is is not uh, on-screen space. So it's no na narrative. So it? for you, narrative hinges on the reverse shot, but in the history of cinema, that's not true. That simply is not the case. I mean, it was a very long time in early films. They had become narrative films before anyone got the idea of oh. You can change the angle. That didn't happen for quite, quite, you know, maybe 10 years or so. And yet there were little stories being told in those films. I'm not so sure that narrative hinges on the reverse shot. And if that were true, 
That would be a distinction from theatrical narrative. Certainly, we don't have the opportunity in theater, but, you know, I went to see um, uh, a great performance of Richard III before I came here. Uh, Mark Rylance's Richard III, which is a complete game changer. And if you got to New York and you could see it, it would be, or if he came here, it would be extraordinary. But I was in the same seat in relation to the stage, and the stage picture didn't change. So, I mean, I have a big question whether you need the reverse angle to make narrative. I think you need time to make narrative. And I think you have here something that is called dramatic conflict. If you're looking at a painting, you can imagine that there's dramatic conflict going on in the painting. You can imagine, gee, what were those people thinking, and is he about to murder her, and is that why his arm is there? Or those things are for you to imagine. Here, they're right for your ears and eyes. So I think it's a narrative film. So I May I answer? Gig and shoes. But you... <laughs> I try, sorry, my clips are bad today. Yeah. Um, I, I thought you would... Uh, uh, your argument would, would be that he, 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 he makes a critique of Hollywood, and so Hollywood uh, narration would be... Uh, could not be without a shot, reverse shot. So, yeah, so this absolutely. Could be, uh, and so, the people who so. came to Warhol films at the time and subsequently, what they miss more than anything is the reverse shot. They look, and at five minutes, at ten minutes, they think, when am I going to see editing? When am I going to see the other angle? They have come to expect that. Uh, and somehow for them, that's what defines storytelling in cinema. But why? Oh. I, I think they're recording our discussions for eternity. <laughs> Uh, because I was just thinking that it's really interesting what you just noted. I, I was trying to not listen to what Chuck was saying because I felt there is there are two kind of narratives. There's a visual kind of narrative that I was trying to understand, trying to um, grasp the discomfort in which Edie is put um, without really listening to the um, discomfort of sound that Chuck is giving us all the time. I found it really annoying you know, to watch the movie and listen to him at the same time because I also find felt this kind of discomfort and I felt and I hoped that at one point I would be in a situation um, that I have in a museum looking at the picture that is moving without having this constant um, talk of Chuck and actually I was just talking to my um, my colleague here, and I and I asked, "Did you get this whole abortion thing?" And she was like, "No, I was just talking about like she she doesn't want to get fat." So, I I have to be honest, I didn't really really um, think about abortion and baby all the time. But what I what I kind of felt was her discomfort in the center of the scene. So, but. To cut a long story short, it was just this parallelism of, of two narratives, a visual and an acoustic. And I, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, but this is sound cinema. What he is making, as opposed to the first silence and the stillies, he is making sound cinema. He is making a film in which image and sound exist together, hopefully, in some meaningful relationship. And the meaningful relationship here is that the sound or the words are constantly interrupting maybe our pleasure in looking, although I don't find it so interesting to look at. I mean, I can look a little bit at the moving shadows and the way, you know, the image changes a little bit. It's not an uninteresting image, but it would not hold me for 66 minutes if it was not, if there was not this dialogue between image and sound. And that's what sound films are about. Um, so you could make it into another film, but it would be another film. And uh, clearly, 
Maybe Edie wants Chuck there needling her. Maybe she doesn't. I suspect that she does, that this is the relationship at this moment in her life, and Gino is superfluous. But we're told at the very beginning that this is a triangle. He describes it as at the important angle of the triangle is Edie Sedgwick, you know? And then there's Gino, and there's also a horse, you know, that could be a triangle there. And it's at beginning, it seems like some pornography, possibly pornographic movie where she's going to fuck the dog or something. I mean, that's suggested. And then he gets less important, and there is Chuck, who is watching um, the Andy surrogate. But Andy doesn't talk when he watches. Chuck talks incessantly. I was just thinking, I still this this um, shot to counter shot issue. I find really fascinating. I'm trying to think this through of the denial of the of the counter shot and how how that that denies and it's another way of denying Edie any sort of agency, the character on screen any agency to um, we, we don't get any perspective any of her perspective. She can't control what the camera then shows us by typically revealing the that which she sees. Well, she um, wouldn't be in control of that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever was making the movie would be in control of that. Um, but, um, you know, it's a very interesting thing. When Morrissey comes into the picture and he begins really directing those movies, that's the first thing he does. He imposes counter shots. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they just turn into you know, B-movies or softcore porn movies that like any other movies. And that's because he does that. He says, why don't we have the reverse angle? Okay, there's a question here. Um, I have two questions. One is I was really struck by your idea of um, in the, the screen tests that their time is not our time. And I was wondering if that was reflected in this film at all or if you found that sort of difference between the viewer's time and their time. And then also I was wondering if you guys could speculate on the presence of the dog, because I was kind of surprised. And I feel like dogs, I mean, that it seems metaphorical. Like there's a mythological aspect. If Edie is the goddess, then the dog is her familiar, or, you know, like you could build some kind of art historical story out of that. Yeah, I think I probably wasn't clear at the beginning. I said this was one of the rare films where our time is the time on the screen. And there was never an attempt to show this split with the second reel at the same time. And that's also why I think it's a narrative film. It's going somewhere in time, as opposed to something like Poor Little Rich Girl, where she's just puttering around the house or those films. Um, so I, I think this is one of the exceptions of the Warhol films. Um, mythological. The dog is named Horse. Horse is another name for heroin. Uh, they're all doing heroin as well as speed. Um, you know, Edie was famous for when she had her brief period where she painted. She painted horses. Um, so I, I think you can find multiple references. I'm not sure I would know what the mythological reference is. It's not the first thing that would come to my mind. I mean, you know, but basically I think, you know, that dog gets up on the bed and you think, what is going to go on here? <laughs> yes. I would like to know if you uh, know something about the comments made later on in the film, uh, which uh, we as um, um, the watching people cannot hear exactly. It's maybe some some comment by uh, Andy or someone else. The whispers that we yeah, hear. Yeah, the whispers. And I, I hear the name Gino a lot. So do you know anything about that? I don't. Um... There is a sequence where E, two sequences actually, where Edie and Gino are whispering to each other. And since there's only one mic, it's really hard to tell where the sound is coming from. And so I tended to presume that, and there's a reference then by Chuck who says something about them whispering to each other 
in an attempt to cut him out. Uh, and so I always read it that way, but maybe you can hear off-screen voices. Um, I, I would, never noticed that. Did I was you? sort of reading, I, I, I maybe reading into it too. I, I thought that it was, they were sort of trying to give advice or comments to Gino. Like, and I thought he said Gino sleep or something. And then Gino was sort of playing as if he was sleeping. So I sort of felt like there was some kind of communication trying to go on from off screen to Gino. It wasn't coming from Chuck. It was coming from someone else. Because his, his actions get, uh, um, uh, He, he doesn't uh, do very much stuff in the end of the movie. He, he, uh, uh, he kind of stops talking and reacting and maybe these comments refer to this uh, change of his person. I don't know. That's my uh, guess. Well, I just always read that Gino gets incredibly bored with his role. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, he's done what he can do. She is really not particularly responsive and they're pretending that they're interested in each other and clearly they aren't and he just gets bored is how I read it, you know. I, they seemed a little more interested in each other than <laughs> than you, you've been painting, I thought. It seemed to me, I was, I didn't remember it that way, but I thought it seemed, she seemed a little lost in the the kisses and he seemed to have some sort of interest in kissing her. I mean, maybe this is... Uh, I think you have to really want to see something to see that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other comments? A comment here? <laughs> yes, Henning Engelke. Uh, I, was, I was just wondering... Uh, If you're also suggesting that this film is about uh, the situation, if you control an image, like Chuck Wien sort of does, uh, you control the person, sort of, or what the person is supposed to mean, to be? Um, whoever has the camera has power. Um... You know, I mean, that's the thing that some people never understand when they get into being part, acting in a movie, that whoever places the camera, turns it on, turns it off, has the power. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and there was a second, second part to my question. Uh, I find it striking when you said that you think uh, Andy Warhol placed, framed the, the image. Uh, so... There would be the question uh, of his uh, apparent, uh, apparent of him apparently not being interested in what's going on after that. But he, maybe, if you're right, he framed the image and then he went away. And so I see there a tension between controlling the image and giving up the control over the image. Or pretending to give up? Pretending to give up. Pre pretending to give up. Uh, I mean, very often, uh, Warhol walked away and then he walked back. The myth that Warhol was seldom present when the films were actually taking place or once the setup happened, he never looked through the lens again, that's a myth. I mean, he was there. Um, but he gave people a lot of rope to hang themselves with. He gave them a lot of space to let them figure it out. I mean, Callie Angel, who, you know, did just wrote this monumental book on uh, the first volume of the Cat Res on the screen test alone, on the stillies, um, had a theory, and it had to do with Warhol's Catholicism. Uh, and she really thought that Warhol set up this moral arena in which people then had choices, had could exercise free will within that, um, and that the choices they made, if they were bad choices, that was their problem. You know, they it was also a place that they could discover what their choices were. But the setup is extremely important. I mean, it's the same kind of thing when people look at uh, a film like, which is has a certain relationship, 
Michael Snow's Wavelength, um, which is a great minimal film, and Warhol was a kind of pop minimalist, and certainly the films are very strongly minimalist films. Um, and in uh, um, Wavelength, the camera is here and high, uh, making, you know, it sees those windows on a slight diagonal. And that trip is very interesting and complicated toward those windows because you lose one side of the room before you lose the other. You know, if the camera had just been dead on front, one, it would have been hard to read the space, but two, there wouldn't have been anything very interesting to look at. And just that small complication of introducing the diagonal was really a great deal of what makes that film great. Um, Warhol understood the same thing about diagonals, yeah. yeah. I'd like to ask again about the detail that you mentioned already in your speech uh, before, uh, and that was the... Uh, the in-camera editing that we saw in the middle of the of the picture. Uh, you referred to, uh, to this as something like uh, a technical necessity of uh, the movie camera that has to be uh, loaded again, uh, if, I, if I got it correctly. No, no, no. So the camera is loaded only once, and that's it dead in the middle, and you see that. You see the reel run out and the little punch marks and all of that. And then it starts again, and it always starts in this camera with something like a false start. You get the registration of an image, uh, and then there's white leader, and then it really starts recording in time. And that's simply, and they let all that stay. But there is that two, two, twice in the second reel where the camera is stopped. Maybe it stopped because one of the actors asks for it to stop. And I think that's what happens, looking at it tonight, I think that's what happens the first time. I think that Edie suddenly was worried about her makeup and uh, uh, signaled, maybe they had signals. You know, like in certain documentary films, you've gone too far, now you have to stop. Maybe they had those. I don't know if they had those, and these people aren't around to ask them. Um, but something makes them stop at that point, and dramatically, it's a wonderful point to stop. And when they come back, she's fixing her makeup, and he's commenting on the fact that you do, you look fine. You know, your makeup isn't running, your eyes, mascara isn't running. So that's hard to tell. The second time, I think it's an accident. Because in the second reel, there does seem to be something slightly wrong with the camera. You begin to notice, for one thing, the tremble, you know, that it's, um, it, the registration isn't quite right, and it loses focus by the end. Uh, so there's something wrong in the second reel with how they just how they've loaded the magazine. Not enough to make them stop, but something. So th the way I wanted to pose my question was um, confronting you with another uh, way of, of viewing that um, uh, that uh, break uh, inside of the movie because I I saw that there's uh, or, uh, actually three breaks. So there were uh, two longer black screens followed by another one that was very short and all three you could read all three as a, as a break through the narrative so my question would have been um how would you interpret that, that uh, way of showing and 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 an really explicit break in that narr narrative and uh, keeping in mind the diversity of the breaks also so I read this as some kind of showing that still, if we read this as uh, uh, making uh, real time and film time conform to one another, that there's still some kind of power that is constructing this uh, uh, picture that we see. Uh, oh, absolutely. And this was just very common in... Um uh, avant-garde film. You have someone like Bruce Connor um, using as part of his image the countdown leaders um, that usually are not shown 
at the beginning of the films, they're they're for the projectionists. They're not for us. It would break the illusion to see that the film had to be focused. Uh, Warhol included all that. The still, the short films end with the camera beginning to be the image beginning to be light struck. When the film is running out through the gate, it suddenly gets bright. It goes dark a little bit again, and then there's nothing but there are punch marks. Um, all that stuff is included. And for us, the effect is to break the illusion, yes, that that's real time and those are real people, you know, uh, um, actually doing things. This is a movie. And so all those signs of moviness, that, that was very common practice to just leave them in. Yes, comment here. Um, yeah, just going back on the narrative a bit. Um, it felt that for an improvisation, everything was so well orchestrated somehow with um, like a growing tension and E.T. being like defending herself all the time and having this really mental kind of um, aggressiveness by Chuck or like, yeah, she had really like to defend herself somehow and then the frame will like completely um, serve this, this, the content of the film somehow. So I felt that as if, nothing was anyway other. There is also this quite um, middle moment where Chuck is basically reading while they are starting to make up together. And um, and yeah, everything seemed actually very well planned, at least. And um, yes, topics even of, or like basically E.T. or vanity is addressed and we have to to see how she, as a woman, behave and answer to this kind of uh, uh, aggressive, manly, um, yeah, attacks for one hour, and the tension is really growing. And then I, w my question will be then, is that world wa still Warhol film, or then don't we see like really the um, actors? Is that not like the film of the actor somehow? I mean, the, the framing, if, if it is framing, it's somehow completely fli fitting with all what we see happening. But then the kind of, I'm, I'm really questioning the relation between Rahul and what we see. If, if it seems just so, so precise in what it address and yeah. Um. You know, this was a period in the 60s when a lot of people who weren't interested in being, in quotes, professional actors were still very aware of what went on in acting classes. And in acting classes, in quotes, method acting classes all over New York, you would have found long sessions of improvisation where people were given an objective in the scene. In this scene, you want to get him to divulge where he's keeping his bank book. And the, and the other actor would not be told what your uh, uh, intention or your objective was in the scene. And the other actor would be told, no matter what happens, you want to keep her from going into that room. Um, and long improvisations would arise simply out of those simple objectives, sometimes complicated with a notion about it's not you, but it's your character who is a guy who's quick with his fists or something like that. That's what's going on here. There is this knowledge of what happens in a dramatic improvisation that Chuck is employing, uh, but he has included an Edie. You know, what Edie knows is a kind of mystery. I think it is that she's brought a guy home and she's trying to decide whether she's going to fuck him on camera. Um, and she's decided before the camera rolls that she's never going to do something like that. But her character of Edie has to decide whether she's going to let this guy get in her pants. What she's not counting on is that Chuck is going to run this kind of constant interference in her being able to even to concentrate on her or figure out if she likes him or not. Yeah. And so Chuck knows everything that's going to happen. She doesn't. Yeah, I just wanted to ask something else. Um, so you uh, mentioned before that it was kind of a... Um, 
triangle relation between the three. And um, I was just asking myself whether isn't um, whether Chuck is not um, some kind of indirect director in this film because he um, influences the the whole film the whole time and yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, Chuck is making the narrative happen. Uh, he's timing when certain things happen. He knows how to get her more irritated or less irritated. Absolutely. And he's off screen. He's in the space where a director might be, except the director is usually by the camera. Uh, so that complicates things, you know. He's an off screen presence who isn't quite a director. He's a character in this movie. Uh, it's just that we don't see him. So it's very complicated what role he plays. Ronald Tavell has said in an interview that he, in Life of Juanita Castro, where he's the on-screen director, that um, he said he never expected to play that part. He thought, he wrote it naively, thinking that Andy would do that. And he said, and then when he got there and showed him the script, Andy was saying, okay, now you'll be the director and da -da -da. And he said, and then I slowly realized that I was one of the people he was studying also. And I think what's interesting here is that Chuck, um, Chuck is also the object of our um, um, criticism concern. He's stuck in this triangle as well. I think as much as it's directed at Edie, he's implicated in it as well. And that's part of not his doing maybe the on-screen off or the off-screen director, but not the director of the film. The director of the film, Andy Warhol, has managed to capture Chuck, to make Chuck think that he's in charge when he's also someone that we can observe and analyze differently from Edie, but still he's under our observation. I mean, and and uh, it's nailed when Chuck is described as a voyeur. Uh, the stand-in voyeur for Andy. Um, but a voyeur as a character, even if we don't see him. And that's what I meant about it being a sound film, that you can have one of the three angles of the triangle, a character who you never see, whose only uh, uh, presence is made known through sound. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just on the, the triangle and the kind of power what you also have is, of course, the off, the back, and the four. And Edie's in the four in this kind of concept of the zoom, let's say the woman in the zoom. There is no physical zoom of the camera, but she's in the, f in the front. So you also have this kind of take on the levels and of power struggles in placement of within the frame, which I think was also just an interesting point to... Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a terrific observation. Mm -hmm. Any other terrific observations? <laughs> other observations, <too>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, we can go have a glass of wine. If there's, would it, does anyone have a last comment? It's um, Amy Taubin was only able to come to Europe for two days, so it's quite um, an honor and thrill to have her here. Ah, so someone wants to take advantage. Sorry, just because of I no, didn't know that you were in the Michael Snow film, and what was the line? <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm here. He's on the floor. I think he's dead. Um, um, I just got here and there's a man on the floor and I think he's dead. No, he doesn't look drunk, he looks dead. Well, what shall I do? I'm frightened. Could you come over, please? <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think wait, I'll wait, wait downstairs. <laughs> and you have to know that I, the reason I know it is we had to lip sync it because Shirley Clark's Niagara wasn't working, and so we had to post-dub it, and it was complicated. No one knew how to lip sync, so I didn't, he didn't, and so it was like every word of the sound was pasted in and done a hundred times over. I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was shot in your and Richard's loft, no? It shot in Michael's loft. Oh, it is, Richard okay. and I, at that point, lived uptown on Riverside Drive. Ah. 
I didn't actually ask a question. I just read your lines. Um, but um, did you have to repeat your shots at any point with that film, or did Michael Snow? <laughs> no. It um, the the zoom inched forward in the space. If that's not accurate, but you know that's what it looks like. Uh, and Michael would stand there and decide, it'd been with his musician's sense of time, when to move the zoom a little forward. I was clumsy. And at a certain point, leaving that shot, as I left, I brushed against the camera. And in the next shot, if you have very sharp eyes, you can see that the shot is ever so slightly reframed before the big reframing happens at the end just because the zoom couldn't go all the way and it had to be reframed. But there's this tiny, very embarrassing glitch in the film because I hit the tripod as I left. But nothing was reshot, no. Ah, so it's a chance to ask Amy about every film that she's... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you so much for bringing that up. But I think um, we should... Um, let Amy get some rest. Um, thank you so much for participating, and please join me once again for thanking Amy Taubin yeah. for being here with us for her talk. Thanks. Good audience, and also asking such really good questions and having great comments and lasting as long as you did. Indeed, thank you. And I, I want to take the chance for to. Ich sag's auf Deutsch. Die nächste Lecture in zwei Wochen steht wieder bevor und äh, die Referentin ist auch heute hier gewesen. Antje Krause Wahl wird dann über Warhols TV sprechen. Ähm, Warhol hat auch Fernsehen gemacht. Auch das ist sehr sehr spannend anzuschauen. In zwei Wochen geht's weiter. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause. Bis bald. Thank you. 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 Thank you.